you know, if I had a $20,000 grant and someone told me for the next six months, you could do whatever you want, will you take it? And I realized that I probably would. So I decided I'm going to save $20,000 aside as just like the grant money for myself. And then I'm going to spend six months pursuing what I want to do. At 80, 90 years old, looking back, what really matters at the end of the day? Like, what are you really working so hard for? What is it that truly drives you fulfillment? So that propelled me to actually take the step and thinking whether that is the direction I want to take and exploring. Welcome back to another episode of White and Shine. I'm your host, Dawn Ashiba Fabe, and I have my co-host, new co-host, hey, old co-host. No, no. It's a, it's a, yeah, I stepped down already, but I come and stand in. Alex, you better come back quick. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> if not, you're losing your seat, uh, okay? But yes, I'm your host, Reggie, aka your chief financial coconut. And today we're going to talk about the topic, which is can we still afford to take career breaks for passion projects? Mm, mm, mm. I think it's a it's a follow-up to some of the career break episode that we did. La. We want to move a little bit deeper into the whole passion project side yeah. of things. You know, how does this thing work? Whether that's a What's luxury a or a necessity. You know, yeah, when because you everybody do everybody wants a break these days. <laughs> Except for the people who have involuntarily been given that break because yeah, of the layoff. They want a gonna break. Want a break or gonna break. <laughs> so to help us explore this topic a little bigger we have two guests on set some of you might recognize one of them but I'll pass the time over to them to do a self-introduction Hi everyone, I'm Keith. I run a front row media podcast. So this is where a podcast where I personally try to explore my intellectual interests. So I'm in the midst of what I call a career break on my intellectual eat, pray, love era. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he left his job to do this passion project. Yep. Uh, yep. So you don't want to eat, pray, love. Yeah, I want to eat, pray, love with my mind. That's what I'm, I'm trying to do now. Yeah. I love this like analogy of your eat, pray, love. Um, I'm Jasmine. I'm founder and coach of the Busy Woman Project. Um, uh, we are a coaching company for modern women and leaders to get unsuck, break free and live well. And Jess also left her corporate job to do this passion project several years ago, right? That was in 2016. Yeah, yeah, yeah 2016. Yeah. And you started and then you went full time to yeah. grow it bigger. Yeah. Give our audience an update. I mean, they probably heard you in the earlier episodes. Where are you now with this project? Yeah, I'm focused on coaching. So mm. we started off as a community in 2016. Community but it's so evolved oh my God. over the years. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And I think it also evolves with like a personal, like as an individual evolves, like the direction shifts as well. So now my focus is really on one-on-one coaching and group facilitation mm. workshops. Mm. The yeah. Women project. Okay, check it out. Yeah. What about you? You share a little bit more. Like, where were you? What do you leave? And you know, how did you end up in this? I was a civil servant at Enterprise Singapore. So I kind of wrote on LinkedIn the two reasons why I left. I think the first reason was that as a civil servant, you have to manage the intricacies of bureaucracies. And I realized that. I had colleagues who were much better than me at that. Mm. If you ask me to stuff a report, stuff a, a boss's trip, I think I'll be the one tripping over myself. So I was like, hey, I'm not going to be a burden. I think in four or five years time, even as hard as I try, I probably will be average at best. Mm. So I was figuring out, hey, this is not my superpower. Is there something better for me outside? And then the second thing was that maybe I'm dating myself. To some people, I'm old. Some people, I'm young. I'm like 29 this year. I'm married, but I don't have kids yet. And I was thinking, hey, you know, there will come a time when maybe hopefully I have children. And by then, there really isn't a time for me to explore my intellectual interests. So I figured if I can do it now, let's do it now. So I, I decided to save up, save all my money, save up some grants for myself. So I thought about it as, you know, if I had a $20,000 grant and someone told me for the next six months, you could do whatever you want, will you take it? And I realized that I probably would. So I decided I'm going to save $20,000 aside as just like the grant money for myself. And then I'm going to spend six months pursuing what I want to do. I was curious when you went in with an intention, like, is it to build? something like where's your true intention is it to build something that's sustainable or is it more like you know it's a hit or miss i think for now i'm like too early in i'm like i probably need to get more reps i'm sure like with the with you guys the financial coconut you guys spend many hours and reps before you guys can see like oh this is gonna take off so i, I feel like i'm really at the beginning stage where i'm like figuring out my voice figuring out what i'm interested in and what i'm good at i think those take time that's why you buy yourself six months maybe at three months when i'm like spending money and my wife maybe gets a little upset at me she can say hey you better start <laughs> you know better start really thinking about this seriously but i'm only like two weeks in so i think i still have i still have a chance to kind of like see where i can bring this towards yeah, yeah. Mm. T- t- tell our audience a little bit more. How are you affiliated with George 
Hey, George Macha, my friend, right? Anyway, yes, <laughs> George, if you want to come, welcome you, right? Talk about your third book, huh? But anyway, yes, yes. Yeah, so George, you was our former foreign ministers, and he, I think, lost the 2011 general election. The loss in the election actually unlocked him to go and explore a new career path, which included going to the Vatican City and serving on the council, and also uh, serving as a chairman for Robert Quark's company. So I think he actually did quite well in his career transition. But going back to the story, he wanted to work on a series of books. It's called Musings 1 to 3. At that time, I was in grad school. So I had a chance to ask him some questions and I was one of those people that kind of itched him to say like, hey, you should try to go and write a book. And he was like, oh, you know, I don't really feel like writing. It's a lot of time. But then when the pandemic hit, all you had was time. <laughs> so I was like, hey, it's time to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's he, a sign. It's, it's a, a sign, sign It's a sign. And he did it. So I, I managed to be at like the front row seat uh, working with him on the books. To be honest, he did most of like, I see like 95% of the intellectual heavy lifting. And all I did was really be on the side, be useful when I can. And for me, that was a huge learning experience. So after that, I was like, what if we could, you know, get more access to people with really deep insights to the general public. And selfishly for me, I wanted to do that for myself. So I was like, the best way to do it is maybe through media. So that's where I decided to go down this path of interviewing people that I find to be really intellectually interesting, but they might not be currently priced right in our current media ecosystem. Can you elaborate? <laughs> yeah. What do you mean by they're not priced right? And who is interesting? Yeah, here's a good example, right? I recently interviewed Irene Ng. She wrote S. Rajaranam's biographies. So she spent close to 20 years writing those two books. S. Rajaranam was our first foreign minister. He was also our first cultural minister. And he was Lee Kuan Yew's like second or third guy, right? There's Go King Sui and Rajaranam. Go King Rajaranam, Lee Kuan, Lee Kuan Yew. Yes. She wrote a like really long book. Like, you spent 20 years on this book. And then it gets, it appears on CNA, Lawrence Wong launches it, PM Lawrence Wong launches it, and then it appears on a Straits Times bestseller list for a week and then it just disappears. Yeah. And then no, no one remembers it, right? So now there's a new thing. Yeah. And I figured, hey, what if I could interview her and then treat her with the proper respect, read both books and then interview her and ask interesting questions. So that was like kind of the line I was thinking of. That was why I decided to do what I do. And I said to myself, at best, it become a career transition. At worst, it's just a career break. So that's how I saw it. Nice, nice, nice. Okay, okay but speaking up for the media, so sometimes certain characters are not entirely media friendly or like you say, price right for the media because it, it fails to get the I attention mean, or the eyeballs I mean, that they need to survive. Ma. I mean, so I get it. No, how, so how, just, how are you <laughs> framing yours to overcome that problem? Yeah, so I thought that for her, she probably had a marketing problem, meaning that she probably is not like familiar with the media ecosystem. She moved to the UK. And then I think also because it's a high barrier to entry, you know, she wrote both books. Just to give you a sense, the first book is about 500 pages. It was, it came out in 2009. Minister Mentor Lee Kuan Yew back then wrote the foreword. The second book came out 2024. So she spent that gap writing the second book and researching the second book. And the second book is about 600 pages. So if you want to like really get the gist of her book, you have to read both books. It's 1,200 pages. If you're like a normal person working a job, who has the time, right? So I figured, hey, now I'm like free. I bought myself some time with that $20,000 grant. I'm going to try to read the both books and try to make myself a better person and then also be a better interviewer in that case. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, fair, fair. I want to kind of push that a little bit, right? Like in the past, when it comes to mainstream media, of course, you know, they have certain airtime, they have certain things that they're going for. But these days, long form content works, right? We it don't does. hear about every week, right? It does. So, so but there's a, a lot of work that goes behind the scene in terms of marketing and framing it so that it is attractive, clickbait, yeah. viral. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. it's hard. To be honest, a lot of these deep things have a lot of value, but they're not viral content. Okay. They're not clickbaity okay. enough. So then the longevity of it dies off, ma. Okay, barring, right? barring this become a media, you know, how to do media <laughs> discussion. And, and wait, that's why it's a useful thing to see it as a career break. Because it means to me that even if it doesn't take off, at least I read those two books. For me, I felt like I've grown, right? Mm. Uh, whether it's, it's taken off or not, it's a good to have. So that's why it's at best, you know, it's a career transition. It can take off. But at worst, I, I read some books, I've interviewed some people, I can apply for the next job. This is a CV booster because I can say, hey, I interviewed these people. Mm -hmm. This is the books I've read. This is the things I, I've taken away from it. So, I mean, maybe my coach here will probably help me more. Okay, okay. Yeah, but I, I like that attitude, man. It's like 20,000 grand to do and pursue what you like. Um, and I think it's also quite interesting that you chose to do it at this stage of your life because you it's like only career, just right? in that sense 29 is like a few steps to pick career yeah it's like you know, you're for just a lot of middle you're in for the next promotion soon but yeah. you decide to okay stop go and do your own thing and figure out and come back later yeah. I think 29 is a very interesting age as well because turning 30 is typically the, the time when you are reevaluating like your life choices that you made in early 20s so I'm, I'm curious if that resonates with you like because relationship typically I mean if you're not married that 
people start to reevaluate career choices as well, something that you made in 21. And now you're like, am I actually on the right track? Yeah, correct. This is me putting on my government hat last time as a civil servant, <laughs> right? You, you give out grants. The point of a grant is so that you can incentivize people. And how I sought to kind of reframe it towards myself was that, hey, actually a lot of people spend money now uh, on career breaks. They go holiday, they travel. They might just laze around for six months to a year. And I thought of, you know, if I have this kind of money that I can use and try to achieve some stated goal in my mind. It'll be useful deployment of my time and energy as well. So when we think about like career break and speaking about hitting 30, for me, it was just that, hey, I actually have a like small window of time where I'm still flexible enough. I don't have that many considerations. I don't have like a very big house payment I have to pay. I don't have like a huge car payments to pay or I don't have like kids to support. So now I'm still young, right? I think once you grow older, a lot of them have many of these financial considerations they have to factor in in their career like development. So for me, I thought, hey, I'm just going to take this six months to a year and just work on this. If it works out, it works out. If it doesn't, it's okay. I can always find another job and it's a good CV booster as well. That's how mm. I saw it. Just to kind of contextualize for our audience, right? Because a lot of audience, are, I think uh, they're more than 30 already. Lah. Also, when they're listening, it's like, yeah, you know, when I was younger, maybe, you know, but, but when we kind of fast forward to where it is today, right? When you're like mid-30s, you kind of already have a lane. You know, I know it sounds very sad, lah, right? Right. Do you have something to say on that? I see Jess's <laughs> face, right? It's like <laughs> she has something to comment. You know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm I'm in my mid-30s, right? But I think similar to the life stage, I have no kids. Um, so I have a little bit more freedom and flexibility around it. But there are so many layers to think about it, right? So I think the first layer I'll open up is more around what is the intention that we're actually pursuing this career break or passion project for and whether you can actually do it within your existing role as well, right? I think that's something that if people are in their mid-30s, have like a lot of responsibilities to consider as well. In some ways, you had a more structured way of thinking about this, right? You you kind of plan it. There was some, what I would just collectively call de-risking, you know, strategies, right? Maybe you could share with our audience, like yeah. help us understand that de-risking yeah, process. I think when I first started in 2016, I really went with my heart. So it was like, whichever I was passionate about, I'm going for it. So that was when women empowerment was rising, and when health and wellness was rising as well. And so I brought that together to see where that would take me. But in terms of like financial planning and structure, I wasn't as diligent about it. So the way I actually look at it at this point in time, I set out like really like a company's P&L for myself. So you look at it as a grant, but I look at it as like a projections of like over the next 12 months, what is the expected revenue that I'm going to get and what are the costs and looking into my lifestyle as well, like what I'm comfortable with giving up, what actually really matters to me. So the financial piece actually played a way bigger component as I was taking it. Like I wouldn't call it a passion, a project at this point in time, but as I was stepping out of corporate again, that became a bigger consideration for me in my 30s. Mm, mm, mm. I mean, you did it twice, right? Essentially, yes. in and out of the same project. Yeah, that's yeah, correct. Yeah, okay, yeah. so okay. I did 2016 to 2020. That was like when COVID happened. Yeah. And then just started again in 2020. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I got to know her when she was in her corporate grind. I was like, this lady is not part of the corporate world. <laughs> <laughs> Like, what is girl doing here? <laughs> right, shortly after the time, oh, I'm back on this project. So yes. this correct. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> To the next question, right? Because um, for both of you, you all were able to figure out and sit down and decide that, hey, I don't think this is cut out for me. I don't think I belong here. I want to do something else. But the truth is that level of self-awareness is what not everyone has. Mm. How do you come to that realization? Fair. Because it's not just about a strategy, right? So we talk about your realization first. So your intent to do something else. Then we talk about the de-risking strategy of mm. it, right? Okay, so we start with the first part, yeah. I think for me, I just looked at myself objectively. Where was I spending my time? How much of my time I'm spending on doing the work that I'm doing? And I asked myself, is this something I wanted to be doing for the long term? And what I did specifically was also that I spoke to people that were five or six years down the journey from me. Mm. Mm. So then I asked myself, like I, I chose like a sample of 10 to 11 people I spoke to, had these interviews with them, basically asking them when you were at my age or when you were at this stage in your career versus now, right? What were some of the things you wish you'd done differently? What were some of the things that you were proud of? And one of the findings I came back with was that actually a lot of them wish they'd taken risk earlier in, mm. in their career. So for me, I was like, okay, that's a useful rule of thumb. They, they said, actually, I don't mind being here, but I wish that actually I did venture out earlier so I could explore more outside. And then uh, when I came back to myself, I was like thinking, actually, if even the ones who really enjoy their time here wish they did that, maybe it's a sign for me to go out and explore. So they're living vicariously through you. <laughs> <laughs> it's we'll like, find go, out. Kiko, 
<laughs> we'll find out in six months or a year, I guess. But that, that was one of the things I did. And then the second thing I did was just more of like auditing my own life. Like how cheap am I? Do I really need to like go to expensive restaurants all the time? Maybe for one or two date nights, you know, with my wife, like financially, is it okay that I can sustain myself? Actually, I realized that, hey, actually in Singapore, although things are expensive, like what I say, I don't have high fixed costs. Like you, you have kids, you have like a big down payment that you have to pay. Then obviously your fixed cost is higher, but my fixed cost is relatively low. So when I put the two and two together, I was thinking, hey, actually now's a good time. And at the same time, a lot of my peers were going to MBA programs. They were going to- Yeah, it's a thing now. Yeah, I see more and more of my peers looking at those things. And they were yeah. expensive. They're like $200,000. Like yeah. yeah, and I was thinking, hey, if you know, I've spent- say twenty to $30,000 for this X amount. Let's say I come back and I get the same pay again. Will I be happy? I'm like, okay, I think it's fine. It's one-tenth of the investment. I come back. If it fails, I can come back and maybe get a similar job of the same pay scale. So I was like thinking, hey, actually, I'm, what I'm doing is I'm just buying back my time. And when you think about people who like grandfathers and, and grandmothers, you know, when, when they're in the later age, they never said to me once, I wish I worked more, right? They always say that, they wish they explored their pursuit ideas. Pursued their yeah, dreams. Pursued some of the things that they wanted to do when they were young. And my grandfather actually, he was, so he was born in China and he was growing up in a time where there was like, after World War II, you had reconstruction in China. They didn't have the chance to pursue their dreams. Now I have like internet, I have the chance to connect with anyone I want, I have the chance to learn. So I'm like, hey, compared to them, like my life, actually, even if I spent like one year on this, like it's not going to be a catastrophe, right? So mm. I, I, I kind of framed myself in that position. And I think this is a, something worth taking a risk on and when I had this like self-awareness like what you said earlier then it, it clicks for me like okay I'm just gonna try this it's okay if it doesn't work I think you just need to be okay with it not working and then just accepting that like failure is part of life but also know that if it doesn't work out not everything needs to be banked on that that's why you have that savings that you have so, so that, at least you don't have the if only I had tried or what would have happened if I tried I tried right I tried so that's the best thing can happen yeah, you will pop the bubble and then after that you can have clarity to move Right. I actually went through a very similar process Ooh. as you. And it's interesting because one of the phrases that really stuck in my mind was that, I think it was a book or something, but it's like at 80, 90 years old, looking back, what is it that really matters to you? And those were like messages from people that were like dying and what were their biggest regrets. I cannot read that and, book. Yeah. <laughs> I think I cannot read that book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but please. Of course, taking into consideration all the practical things as well, but what really matters at the end of the day? Like what are you really working so hard for? What is it that truly drives you fulfillment. So that propelled me to actually take the step, of course, talking to people and seeing, looking at people like 10 years my senior and thinking whether that is the direction I want to take and exploring. Oh, so you also spoke well. with other people of to course. get... Yes. Mm. So actually that commonality we see there. Of in order I to, to a lot of people arrive so. at, <laughs> In order to arrive at that <laughs> self-realization and awareness, um, speaking to people who have actually gone down a similar path or not that path and getting their insights would help you discover that about yourself sooner. There is this like very interesting exercise as well, which I did the second time round was around like fear setting. I think it was popularized by Tim Ferriss or, or one of those like self-help guys. One of those. Um, <laughs> one of those gurus. Yeah, 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 but it was yeah. more around like instead of like setting goals, what are the fears you are facing? Write it all down and validate it. Like what can you do to prevent it? What can you actually take action that's within your control today to do it? And if it really happens as well, what can you do to mitigate that? So there, there were a couple of frameworks that supported in, I think, confronting those fears because I think a lot of people like you have, a, I can sense a very like entrepreneurial, self-motivated spirit, but sometimes people are afraid of the failure or what fears there are as well. Or the unknown. Mm. Mm. Yeah, especially in Singapore, I suppose. Because in Singapore, our cultural conversation around failure is that, hey, <laughs> failure is something that you want to avoid. And I understand that there is that aspect of it. What I was thinking about was more of what if you cannot fail? Meaning like the worst case scenario even it's like the worst case, worst case that happened to you, even if that's a good outcome, are you okay with that? So I, I kind of like saw it as like, yeah, I'm going to frame the failure as a positive even. Mm. Like if let's say, for example, I'm like working on this now, no one watches it for the next six months. In my view, I just think like, for example, Vincent Van Gogh, he didn't sell a single painting in most of his life. He still painted it and now it's like worth millions. And I thought in hundred years time, there might be someone surfing on YouTube and say, hey, you know, I want to find out about Singapore's history and it's 50th mark. Would this be something that could interest them? So I kind of framed this. If this is the worst thing that can happen, I'm fine with it. And then once you have that mindset, I feel like you're more okay with letting go. You're more okay with trying out new things and experimenting. Hey, I hope you're enjoying Wise and Shine so far. I'm your host Reggie, aka your chief and in Chikokna. And for us to continue to do this show so that you become a tad bit wiser every week, you gotta like, share, subscribe, help us be the algorithm. But even more importantly, if you can, comment in the comment section below. Let us know your thoughts and also some questions that you would love us to answer. Yeah, now back to the show. 
Okay, mm. okay. Yeah, sure. I think there really is like a space for this. I mean, if you think about really? it, right? Why don't you do it? If there's a space for Not it. Not my passion project. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, yeah. so this is quite absolute, right? In that sense, you take a clear cut. Yeah, but I didn't. Yeah, exactly. But you have a lot of things, actually. You got a lot of passion <laughs> projects, right? So actually, how, this year especially. Yeah, how do yeah. you kind of square that? You know, without cutting it off. I mean, we got to bring back down to the practicality, right? It's not just about the financial numbers. It's just a sheer time spent, right? 10 hours a day. Of course, it's an eight hour work day. But you know, it adds up, right? So 50 hours, a lot of things to do. Uh, but how do you do it? Maybe I contextualize a little bit. So my childhood dream was to become a published author. I actually did achieve that in secondary three because there was a school writing program where they put like the best writers in the schools and, and then publish you together. publish. But then so the sad cute. thing is, uh, the published book is only in the participating school. So only like my school, Raffles, and I think one or two others. Uh. Then the other sad thing is as long as you finish your manuscript, you would get published. Oh. <laughs> so it's like, just finish the it. The bar you know? very low. Yeah, la, the bar okay. very low. I mean, the in the first place, low, they okay, select okay. the best. Okay. La, okay, it's also no SC competition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like Tampani's bestseller. Right? Yeah, so uh, the bar only place I could low, go uh, is like the school library. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want, I want I want to see my books in like bookstores and reach a wider audience. It's coming, it's coming. So I am exploring my passion project also. But like you you said, right? Um my life circumstance is a little bit different. I have two kids and four elderly to support, just that some of them are still working, so it's half half the support, not so heavy. But the kids are very heavy, hundred percent financial reliant. So I didn't feel like I could quit my job. And also my circumstance is such that I'm employed. I do many things on the side and then my husband is self-employed. So I take a break. Now it becomes like 100% risk because his job is up, down, up, down. Ma. So we figured like very hard. In fact, anyone who can take a break would be him rather than me. But I really still wanted to work on the book. So when the book deal came along, I thought about it for very long. I think I procrastinated for, I think the time between the first discussion with the publisher and the actual signing took two months. I, actually, I did a little bit like what you guys did. I spoke to other authors. I spoke to Adrian. I spoke to a few others who got published by the same publisher also to understand their journey and experience. And the good thing was that I met um, some who did the book while they were still working. A corporate job. So I, being able to talk to them made me realise, actually I can, but it's just about time blocking. Uh. But, but you guys are right, right? Because I didn't feel like I had the privilege to take a step back and stop my income flow from my corporate job to do this passion project. But I wasn't willing to give up on this passion project. So I haven't been able to pursue that. But this year I was like, I think I really am going to do it. But the time is a big problem. So I, I, I cannot time block. Just to echo that, right? Because I think I did an episode on chills with Quick Shaolin. And then somewhere along the line, she said something like, maybe you could grieve for the younger self that gave up certain things. Oh. You know, because we all go through that, right? You make sacrifices. And the truth is you cannot fact, you cannot like kind of backtrack and check whether your outcome on the other end, right? So you kind of have to grieve on some level. Uh, but, the reality is what pass is pass. Ah, oh. mm. So you got to kind of move forward, you know, with a, with a bit more clarity. Or do so you know? that there's no what if. Yeah, but it's quite interesting to see the two approaches as well, right? Because yes, you have like life circumstances and you're trying to balance all of it out. Balance as much as possible. Well, yours Jess's is actually word, yeah, looking yes. more around like a craft or a mastery of an art. I love the way you frame it in terms of it's like an artist's journey, which mm. may or may not suit everyone, but it is a certain perspective um, as well. For me, I like to add that my wife is a doctor, so she has a very stable career path in a sense. <laughs> More like unstable career. <laughs> doctor life very hard. 30 it's hour stable, work day. <laughs> she, she does have a very torturous work life. Stable life. but torturous yeah, stable work but life. Torturous. <laughs> and that's why for me, I think getting her buy-in was so important because she's working as a doctor and she knows that this is what I want to do and she's currently, you know, working through the path of being a doctor in Singapore. So, for her, she's very self-assured in her career trajectory. Then that helps me to not worry so much about financial considerations. Mm. But for example, if she told me, Keith, like today I want to be a housemaker, for example. Then that would be a completely different conversation, right? <laughs> so for me, that was one. And the second thing is that actually in you procrastinating, I actually think that that's a good thing because you really think whether this is important to you. Sometimes it's okay to give up on things because you realize that those are not important. Mm. The fact that you take so long to really think about it and although there were multiple false starts. Two decades eh, since yeah. I had this dream. <laughs> and now on your first line there, you already made the progress. So I think I think the fact that even you have this procrastination, I think it's a, it's a good thing because it really makes you think, is this something really important to me that I want to spend one or two years working on it? Mm. And, and we shouldn't shame people for doing that. Yeah, I think it's like there's a 
place for everyone to pursue their own passions and yeah, really uh, whether it's done full-time <laughs> oh, or yeah, okay. part-time. Whether it's done full-time, part-time. Okay. Yeah, but cause the, we just need to acknowledge the difference, right? Because full-time, you get eight to 10 hours to really work on it and your growth would definitely be faster than everyone else who only spend like half an hour, one hour here. Yeah. And then for me, because it's like part-time, I would be very strategic about where I carve out this time on. George Lucas did the same thing. He said when he was writing Star Wars, he hated writing. He would go up to a room, an empty room with just the wall. And he said from 9am to 5pm, I can either stare at the wall or write. And that's how he, how he created Star Wars. So, hey, you're already on your way there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I do the exact same thing, right? Mm. I will be in Batam for three days and I will not buy the internet. So the only mm. thing I have is in the in the hotel. And then it's just between like cranking it out, all the writing, all the programming and procrastinating to get to the programming. <laughs> So, so that's actually a tip. Uh. Yeah, yeah, if you yeah, cannot yeah. take full-time, if you don't have the luxury to take full-time, but you have a passion project, then yeah. just cover up, lock yourself in hotel yeah. room or bathroom. Don't, 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 don't. Okay, hey, hey, take care. Don't lock yourself. Uh. Okay, but, but I want to kind of dig a little bit on that whole like you and your spouse type of a, uh, negotiation, right? Because I, I'm quite sure it will be quite a, like, ooh, like why like that, right? So like, how was that kind of negotiation like? So you had to do a, what I call a free trial. So what I did was, I did a few interviews. I said, hey, I'm going to try this on a proof of concept just to show you that I'm serious about it. Because mm. you can talk about it the whole time and then actually never do it. So I was like, okay, I'm in my current job. I'm going to do a few and I'm going to show you that I actually care about this. Right. So then she saw me while well, like searching up what the cameras to use or like she saw me like preparing, reading biographies that were like out of print and stuff like that. So I think when she saw like, oh, you're putting in effort and you're putting in time, uh, even with a full-time job, she kind of saw that, okay, like now you're going to take it seriously. You're going to turn pro essentially. So when she saw that, you know, when I was giving her that free trial of my work, she was like, okay, now that you're really doing it properly, if you want to take six months off and she saw that actually you have been now saving sufficiently and you're willing to give yourself that runway and you're not going to like financially burden me. So that was the, the conversation we had. And then when she saw that I was willing to take it seriously, then she was like, okay, she gave me a blessing. So I think having that conversation, I think well, that was very helpful. For me. But it's true, you know, it's really important because when I was going to do this book, I also asked my husband, mm -hmm. yeah, do you think I should do it? I disappear, need to write. Can you mm. thank the kids or not? Yeah. yeah. He said, yeah, I'm going to do it. In but because such a he cheery that, fashion? Uh, no, like, I mean, there was a longer discussion. But I mean, it's a two-decade-long dream, of you course, know. Of course, right? of course, of so, course. And mm. if you want to go on a life journey with somebody, then this is the last thing you want to be at the back nagging, right? Yeah, I think the spouse uh, you know, 10 years or partner ago, uh, when support. I was younger, then you never let me do this. Huh? Wow, sell uh, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, mm. yeah, if you're serious about this, you know, to relationship together, then some of these things, you just have to tick along the way, right? And everybody got to kind of support each other on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just want to ask, with Keith, you're very sure of the path, you're giving yourself six months. But for you, because you all along, you already had the Busy Woman Project and you in, out, in, out. So what were your considerations in, after the first time, right? When you went back corporate and you jumped back in again, how do you decide, should I keep this as a side passion project or do full time? I calculate the full year's like runway. Like, so for one year, and even sometimes when we talk about three months, six months, one year, right? It's all just projections. So ultimately, we only have the present moment and we have so many things outside of, of our control. But what was within my control was basically setting aside my finances. And I looked at it actually more of like an, if I have, were to have an investment in my company, mm. what would that look like? But the investment is coming for myself. And then dividing that into the next 12 months and taking a salary from it. So I actually have consistent salary. I still put money aside for my own investments and stuff like that. So that's the way I looked at it the second yeah. time around. So you're yeah. your only angel investor in that sense. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I, there are different perspectives to look at it, right? But for me, I looked at it as really like, this is the amount I have and what's the amount I can play around yeah. with with no, that. And I just want to second that because that's what I do, right? Mm. With TFC. When I first started, it was just like me, right? And maybe my business partner. And I also practice that payroll thing. So because I think a lot of people, we're talking about professionals, are not seasoned business people, right? We're talking about professionals that are exploring, doing something on the side. And then they would think like, oh, you know, just take from the same pot, right? Mm -hmm. Like business and individual pot is like the same pot. And I realized it's not very good from a clarity of like, is this working? Because you are too emotionally brought into that thing. Whereas if you kind of separate it, then you know that, okay, okay every month I'm going to draw a re Use salary. Yeah. Originally, maybe I made eight thousand, right? I'm gonna take four thousand or three thousand. Okay, like start out entrepreneur thousand five, very good idea. <laughs> so you can cover a lot of expenses. We kind of go there, right? But you take that pay cut from the entity that you run as a business, and if that thing does not work, it's okay. You you can leave. Mm. You know, rather than you mix everything. You know, some people 
like the older business people, you think like, oh yeah, just take all, right? Mm. Just take all for the same pot, right? And I think it's not good from a, the mental side of things and it's not good from a, whether is this working evaluation. When do you start thinking about that? Just curious. Right like, from the start, because like, I'm a seasoned failed entrepreneur. I committed the yeah. same mistake too the, yeah. the, at the start where the pool seems to be like yeah, from the same together, pot, yes. but now yeah. it's really like separate and it forces you to look at your lifestyle mm. as well, right? Mm. I mean, Reggie can, can speak for himself, like he figured out different ways to actually mm. look at costs, right? Mm. And mm. that is something that's within yeah, your control. Yeah. And that's the part that yeah. I blame Singapore. La. Right? Because <laughs> Singapore is expensive, right? You see a lot of younger entrepreneurs, they're trying to start up in Johor. It's a whole thing. You may not know because you're not actively in that scene. But as you talk to a lot of people, you realize a lot of people are trying to do it there because it's cheaper. And cheaper has a reason, right? Because when it's cheaper, it's lower risk, you can afford to make bigger moves. Mm. Which brings me to the next question. For many working professionals, when they're deciding to take a career break or a transition or whether to stop and pursue their passion project, there's this huge big question mark around and fear of the unknown and the anxiety. What advice would you give to people? I thought about it as how I could use this time to build career capital. So when you look at people who do MBA, for example, they're putting a huge risk. Like for, for example, MBA costs about say 200k USD if you want to go to the top school. So I, I think, let's say you were to do a mid-career MBA, that's a huge risk, right? So you have to ask yourself like, how am I improving my career capital in this case? So when I was leaving, I thought, does this hurt or improve my career capital? If let's say I have to spend the same six months, I'll go travel around the world. Actually, when I come back, the potential employer might look at me and say, hey, you just spent six months enjoying yourself. That's fine. So they'll just take you as your previous job experience. But if I say, hey, after like the six months, if let's say I would like to go into the media, the like more traditional media, could this actually be a useful add-on? Would this be a useful career skill stack that I could, I could showcase? So when I thought about it that way, I was like thinking, okay, maybe I'm investing X amount of dollars into my own personal growth. So that's how I saw it. And it's worth thinking about when you're looking at a career break, whether you're doing it maybe for your own mental health or whether you're doing it to develop a, a skill stack. So for me, it was really, I wanted to be more comfortable public speaking, be more comfortable like reading deep and difficult books. And that was something that I, I really wanted to pursue. And I wanted to be a better, like a better citizen in a sense that I wanted to understand our history, our economics, our business landscape in Singapore better vis-a-vis -vis the world. So uh, I thought, okay, if I could bundle this together, maybe I'll work on a project then I could better explain myself to potential employers if this doesn't work out. So best right. case for me, career transition. Worst case is a career break, but it's also like an investment in my career capital. So that's how I kind of saw it. So if we're hearing you correctly, one advice would be to look at what objective you want to get out of this break or transition. Mm -hmm. And that the can comment be section actually quite good. From the previous one, a similar question. They said, break, just break lah, right? Like, don't need to be so planned, you know? Because I did a thing, right? I left Singapore. I stayed in KL for six months post-founder breakup. Right? It was very bad. And I tell myself, I cannot work. You know, I'm done, right? This is, I cannot stay in Singapore because Singapore, I need to work. But I was already investing a little bit of money and that could convert three point something. Well, more than enough for me to live a life. So I went there. I just cafe hall for six months. Right, we don't, we don't have a plan. But in that six months, I got so bored. <laughs> but at some point, I think the boredom, there's beauty in that because it means you're done. You can do something else already. Sien, mm. then move on. Lah. So Sien, now cafe hopping, do podcasts. Don't, nah, don't. But, but yes, yes, yes. Yeah. But there's one of different journeys. Like, I like how yours was you know, in the meandering. Yeah, very meanderish. You found a purpose, right? But intention in a typical setting, it's quite important as well. Like the reason you are leaving your job as well as the reason that you are trying to use this time for, because I guess we are all quite goal-oriented individuals in Singapore. So that purpose um, is important as well. I think a lot of people actually are feel very anxious when they want to leave, right? Because mm. there's like money issues and then they think about like, so would I be employed again? So it's really to sit with these feelings as much as we want to just YOLO and do it is to be a bit more intentional around like what are these feelings trying to tell me and like what do I really need in this moment as well? I think the other exercise I mentioned was around the fear setting, right? So if you really have fears, like what is the worst that you're afraid of and then make an aligned decision from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love it. Such a great discussion. So what do you guys think? Can you afford to take a career break to pursue your passion project? What are some considerations that might be holding you back or driving you forward? Let us know in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this episode, you can look Keith up uh, on his LinkedIn as well as Jasmine on her LinkedIn or Busy Woman Project. And that's us for this episode of Wise and Shine. We'll see you guys in the next one. Bye. Okay, bye.